Welcome to another Mike Flanders podcast. Today, you guys have got a very special treat. Uh, a Nashville music industry veteran, Joe Kelly, current owner of CDX. But uh, we're going to dive into some of his history. And uh, this will be very educational for any, any artist, whether big, small, indifferent, indie, major, major indie, blah, blah, blah. So uh, welcome, Joe Kelly. Thank you. I'm proud to be here and glad to be here with you. All right. Here we are in June, what, June 26th, I think we are today. Yep. And 99, a uh, little sort of 80-something degrees of out. Kind it's of a not beautiful too day bad. outside. Yep, yep, yep. So uh, I'm just going to pitch the ball straight to you and maybe dive into the history first so these folks can kind of really understand, you know, today's purpose. Okay. So I, uh, I come to be here today um, through a musical family. So my family was into music uh, as a child. And in fact, even before I was born, my parents had a band. Right and on. so I grew up toting stuff in and out of clubs and fire halls and dance halls as soon as I was old enough to carry something. Wow. So I jokingly tell people I never really had a shot at being a banker or an accountant or anything. I was bit by the showbiz bug very early in yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so having grown up through that, my my second love, other than music, was sports. And so I always had a dream to play college football. So I got to do that. And uh, and so the last recruitment meeting with the college football coach, my dad and I were sitting there, and, and uh, his name was Coach Martinelli, and he said, Joe, if you choose to come here, uh, what would you choose to major in? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't have a clue. And he said, well, what are your loves other than football? And I said, music. And he said, we've got a great radio television department here with a completely student-run radio station. And I said, that's my major, <laughs> radio TV. I signed it that day. That's and cool. so wow. I ended up working at uh, 89 Rock, WRDL, yeah, for right. my entire college career. And so... I took my finals at the end of my junior year. I was a little burnt out on everything. I was a little burnt out on the fact that my college courses seemed to be repeating themselves. They kept saying the same things over and over again. And, and I had made a hobby out of watching CMT and TNN and watching the credits after on each show. Mm. So I was writing down and, and, and I was writing down uh, on TNN, on Nashville Now, and those shows like that, the executive producer of all those shows was a man named C. Paul Corbin. Okay. And so I already knew that C. Paul Corbin was somebody that I needed to know. And so I studied all the guests and wrote down all their names. And so uh, my grandfather passed away in 1989, and we went to Kentucky, where we're all from, in eastern Kentucky, Boyd County. And, uh, and uh, shout out to all my Appalachian Americans out there. <laughs> but uh, so uh, we were at my wake, at my grandfather's wake. And I had an aunt there who said, Joe, what are you going to do after college? And my, that was my aunt Babe from uh, St. Albans, West Virginia. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to move to Nashville and get into music business. And uh, she said, really? We know somebody in the music business in Nashville. And I said, you do, Aunt Babe. Who do you know? And she said, well, little Jimmy Fogelsong. And I said, Aunt Babe, you mean Jim Fogelsong, the president of Capitol Records? And she said, yes, little Jimmy. <laughs> and I said, you've got to be kidding me. How do you know him? And she said, well, he's from St. Albans. He's from South Charleston, West Virginia, like we are. And we all belong to the High Lawn Baptist Church there in St. Albans. And when Jim went off to New York to be a record producer, his parents were members of our church and they got elderly and we took care of them. And Jim's daddy lost his eyesight and we took him grocery shopping and got his groceries. And so they've just been like family to us. And she said, I'll write Jim a letter and tell him you're coming to Nashville. A letter. A letter. A letter. And so she did. And so they're about, oh, May or whatever, I took my finals my junior year and went home and told mom and dad, I'm not going back for my senior year. And they said, just what do you think you're going to do? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to move to Nashville and get in the record business. And they said, okay, well, here's where your support stops. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> they said, go make a life. 
Mm-hmm. Here's $500. Don't ask for any more. And so I was driving a five-speed Nissan pickup truck at the time. And my dad said, well, you can't really go to Nashville and get in a music business in a, in a Nissan pickup. Uh, I'm going to get your mom a new car and, and you can have her car. And it was a 1980 Cadillac Coupe de Ville that was as long as this room. Oh and, and so I took off with $500 and my clothes in a 1980 Cadillac and I moved to Nashville on a Sunday. And my plan was to get to Nashville and as soon as I was coming into town, I, as soon as I could see the skyline, I was going to immediately get off and get a motel room. And that would be my base of operations. And I would get a Sunday paper and I would start looking for jobs and a one room efficiency to rent and all these things. And so I don't know if you know this, but I certainly do. The first exit that you come to coming down I-65 South out of Kentucky, the first exit that you come to when you can see the skyline of Nashville is Trinity Lane. Ooh. Which at Ouch. that time mm. was a horrible mm. part of town. Yeah. And so very, very rough. But there was a motel sign there that said the Hallmark Inn, single room, $19.95. <laughs> and I said, that's in my budget. <laughs> so I got off and I went to the Hallmark Inn and I paid them $20 for a room that Sunday. And I went and got a Sunday paper and I, and the room was nice and it was clean and everything. And I found out later why that room was, a, or that hotel motel was a staging motel for uh, troops that were going to Fort Campbell. Oh, okay. So they had a contract with Fort Campbell. Okay. So that's why they kept it so neat as a pin. And, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And so I thought, this is great. Mm-hmm. So the next day, I, Monday morning, I got out and started looking at one-room efficiencies to rent. And they were all t- terrible. They were all in the ghetto. They were all roach-infested in it. Mm. I thought, I've bit off more than I can chew here. Yeah. And so I called home. Oh, and no. my mom and dad got uh, on the phone with me. And I said, listen... I visited these one-room efficiencies. There were only six that were advertised in that Sunday paper. And I said, none of them are fit to stay in. And my parents said, why don't you go back to that Hallmark Inn where you stayed last night for $20 and see what they would charge you for a room for a week? And I said, okay. So I did. And they said, nope, can't do it too close to fanfare. However, we have a sister motel that'll do it over on Dickerson Road. So turn left and go over and turn right on Dickerson Road. Well, that was even into further into, into the, the heart ghetto. of the ghetto, mm. which I didn't know. Mm. I was a greenhorn. Yeah, I was yeah, a country yeah. boy kid. Yeah. I was 21 and I, I didn't know no. anything. And so I got over there and I thought, well, it looks kind of industrial around here, but it'll be fine. And so I walked in and the man behind the glass, the plexiglass or bulletproof glass for all I know, was straight out of central casting in a movie. He was big, round-bellied with a uh, white tank top T-shirt on that had stains all over the front of it. And he was chomping on a cigar that was about four inches long or three inches long. And I don't even know if it was lit. But I walked in and, and, and here's Joe from Ohio, you know, <laughs> I'm in Greenhorn. And I said, uh, hey, uh, they told me up at the Hallmark Inn that you'd rent me a room for a week. What would you charge me? And he looked at me. <laughs> And he, he had a scraggly beard and everything. And he looked at me and he said, a hundred dollars. <laughs> and I said, great. And I whipped a hundred dollar bill on him. And now I had a room for a week. Oh, geez. And then it got dark outside that Monday night. And I mean, everything came out. Gunshots, hookers, hookers were banging on my door. Um, drug dealers were banging on my door. There were sirens all night long. I mean, this was the heart. The Cadillac of, was up on blocks. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> next morning. And so I immediately, then on Tuesday morning, went over to Music Row. And I had my sport coat on, mm-hmm. and I had my little briefcase with my resumes in it. And I went knocking doors on Music Row, like many, many, many people have done. And you, and you could do then. And you could do that. Mm. And people would look at me like I had three heads because my resume still had my Ohio address on it. And I would say, now this has my Ohio address on it, but I've moved here now. I'm, I'm here and I'm ready to go to work. And they would say, well, if we wanted to get a hold of you here, where would we reach you? And I would say, room number eight at the Scottish Motor Inn on Dickerson Road. 
And they would look at me like I was a serial killer yeah, yeah, yeah. because nobody would stay. <laughs> and so oh my God. it was terrible. Yeah. But I ended up renting an apartment and, uh, and getting started. But I did get a chance meeting with Jim Fogelsong because of the letter my Aunt Babe wrote. And uh, So how many weeks after the first week there did you get to meet him? Probably, I'm going to guess it was probably eight weeks Something That's like that. I had been bad. in town. Yeah. I hadn't yeah. been in town long. No. But Jim had just been fired from mm. Capitol Records. So Jimmy Bowen had come in and taken over Capitol. And Jim mm. had a temporary office in Jim Halsey's building. Jim Halsey was a good friend of his because Jim had signed the Oaks to their original contract. And Halsey was the Oaks manager. Mm-hmm. And so Jim had a temporary office in Jim Halsey's building. And, and so I went over and what was supposed to be, a, I'm sure for him, was uh, let me meet this kid yeah. because these people were so yeah. close to my family. And we ended up hitting it off and we met for about three hours and we talked music and we talked all this. At the end of the meeting, he said, Joe, listen. And Jim, if you don't know, was known as Gentleman Jim. I mean, he was such a gentleman. And, and he said, um, Joe, uh, I don't have anything for you right now. Obviously, I don't have a job. But I feel like you and I have made a connection. And if I find something for you, I'll call you. And so I said, thank you so much, Jim. And then I left and I I had to get a job. And so I got a job as a frame carpenter on a frame on a carpentry crew. And so we were working, building a warehouse. And I got home one day after swinging a 22 ounce frame and hammer for 10 hours and the light was blinking on the codafone answering machine. Yeah, and I thought, I well, that thing is broken because nobody knows me. <laughs> nobody calls me. It's him. And it was Jim. Mm-hmm. And he said, Joe, it's Jim Fogelsong. If you want a job, be here at 8 o'clock in the morning at 1102 17th Avenue South, uh, Suite 401. And Joe, wear a sport coat. That's what he said. That was the whole voicemail. And you remember that. I mean, to, I, I'll never forget every word of it because it meant everything to me. Yeah. And I never quit a construction job so fast in my life. <laughs> and so the next morning I was there. And so he and I had spent that time talking music and we spent a lot more time talking music after that. But he put me in charge of listening to demo tapes because the uh, the the company was DPI Records. It was oh, the first yeah, label I that I went to work yeah. for. Yeah. And it was May Boren Axton was the head of the label. And she had written Heartbreak Hotel for oh. Elvis. And so, um, and was friends with Colonel Tom and, you know, just iconic stuff. Her son is Hoyt Axton, who wrote Joy to the World for Three Dog Night. And oh, my God. Greenback Dollar for the Kingston Trio. And... Um, Snowblind Friend for Steppenwolf, Never Been to Spain. I mean, he wrote so many just Classics. copyrights. Yeah. And and so, uh, but Jeremiah Was a Bullfrog was the big oh, one. Oh, yeah, huge. You know, Joy of the World, yeah, yeah. as big as it gets. And, uh, and so, naturally, we signed Hoyt to be the first artist on DPI Records, the nepotism at its finest. Yes, yes. But we also signed Mel McDaniel, who was a big deal at that time, and had had his hits on Capitol, and he was just out of that deal. And uh, probably Jimmy Bowen cut him loose too. Mm -hmm. But uh, So Jim said, we're looking for songs for these artists, and I want you... So Jim started work for that company also? He did. He went to work there as the VP of A&R. Gotcha. And so um, he, uh, he put me in charge of listening to demos, and he said, you bring me the songs that you think are hits. How cool is that? I'm a 21 year old kid. Yeah, I, it it That's was true. unbelievable. He gave me such immediate credibility because we would go to like Douglas Corner for an yeah. artist showcase, yeah. which is sad. It just got shut down. It just got shut down, and yeah. and and so that is terribly sad because yeah. it's been such a big part of everybody's yeah. lives. But we would go into an artist showcase, which they start at six o'clock and and they go to six thirty, and you know. Uh, the artist on stage is showcasing for record people and, and we would walk in and I could feel the people in the room saying, who's the young guy with Jim Fogelsong? Yeah, right it on. immediately gave me credibility. Of course. And yeah. so. Well, you were a set of ease. Right. Mm. What a position to be put in, in your first gig. Mm. 
And so then they gave me the CMA directory of radio stations. And they sent me down in an office, in an empty office. It wasn't my office. <laughs> I didn't have one. I was the boy Friday. Yeah, yeah. I was getting coffee, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so they said, take this directory of radio stations and start calling them and trying to get our records played on these radio stations. So just, there's 2,000 of them in here. Just call about Mel McDaniel and Hoyt Axton. So that's what I did. I, for hours and hours and hours, I would call radio stations and ask them to play our music. And so you'd already serviced the songs, obviously. Yes. yes. And so we'd already yeah. mailed them to them and all yeah. that. Yeah. So you're just following up. Yeah. yeah. And that was my first start into real record promotion because mm. that's what it was. Yep. And so uh, then they put me on the road uh, with Hoyt Axton to do a radio tour. Oh, cool. And Hoyt had the first cell phone I ever saw. It was a bag phone, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One yeah, of them yeah. deals. So was that 90 what? It was probably 90. 90. Wow. 1990 or yeah. 91 maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. so. Yeah, I had a break I'm, in 93, so yeah. I'll yeah. never forget this. Yeah. I'm driving in the Ford uh, Bronco that Ford trucks gave Hoyt every year. They gave him a new one every year because he was as big a voice actor as he was anything else. And Hoyt did movies. He was the uh, the dad inventor in the movie Gremlins oh, wow. that invented the bathroom buddy. Oh, cool. That was Hoyt. Yeah. Wow. And he was in lots of movies. Um, but And he was in all the Bonanza and all the I watched that. Westerns. Yeah. That he kid, was in yeah. all of those. And so he was an actor. He was a singer. He was a songwriter. All these things. But he was also this big voice talent. So he was the guy that did Head for the Mountains of Bush. Oh. Beer. Oh, that right. was Hoyt that right, did that. Right, and he right. made millions of dollars every year doing voice work. Jeez. So he did Ford trucks. So they gave him a new truck every year. So he got a Bronco. So I'm driving the Bronco. Hoyt is on his bag phone. And he's talking to Arlo Guthrie on the phone. Oh, Alice's restaurant. Listen, mm. I thought I had made it. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. Dri I'm going along going, I'm driving Hoyt Axton to Cape Girardeau, Missouri to visit a radio He's station. Talking to He's talking to Arlo Guthrie. Yeah. On the I've made it. You this is it. the pinnacle yeah. of my career. Yeah. I've peaked. You I'm only 21. <laughs> I called my first dog, Arlo. Oh, after, did you? Really? Oh, Guthrie. that's so cool. Yeah. That is very cool. That's funny. And so, <laughs> and you know, his father's Woody Guthrie and this I land know. is your land. I and know. you know, the whole thing is just it's welling up inside of me. It's iconic. It's making me think this yeah. is the pinnacle of my yeah. career. So you were buzzing. Oh. You were buzzing. I had to sit on my hands to keep waving yeah, to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and technology's in the car, too. It's like, wow, we can ring someone from the car. From the car. Can yeah. you imagine? Yeah, yeah. This is Jetson's Yeah, I know, stuff. man. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so about two years in, the company folded. Ouch. And I was on the street. And so um, it was funded by a Texas oil man, and as billionaires often do they get enamored by something else and they yes. go to yeah. fly helicopters yeah. or airplanes or do something else with yeah. their money and their time yeah. and this isn't making sense to me and yeah. uh, now i'm involved in something i don't really understand and that's what happens yep. yep and it happened to us yep well in the meantime in march of 1991 paul lovelace and charlie douglas had founded and started a company called cdx and that stood for Compact Disc Express. CDX was innovative at the time because CD technology was still fairly new. Manufacturing of CDs was still very expensive. And uh, to service a new single out to radio stations, it cost about $6,000 a song. And so record companies just weren't doing it. Mm. They were servicing the top 100 markets in America. So New York, LA, Chicago, Dallas, Atlanta, Everyone in the top 100 cities in America at radio got record service. They mailed them the record. In fact, they FedExed it to them. But there was 2,400 other country radio stations in America that were getting no record service at all from the labels. And so it caused a problem for the labels in that the, these 2,400 radio stations called the record company all the time, begging for record service. So their switchboards were continually tied up with stations calling for record service. And so... 
they still thought, well, to manufacture and mail a CD Pro single out to 2,400 stations costs $6,000. We're still not going to do that for all the singles we release. Right. And by the way, there were still 32 major labels operating on Music Row at that time. Jeez. And now there are three. So um, that was a lot of music and a lot of companies. And so Paul had the idea. Now, ironically enough, Paul had been the VP of promotion under Jim Fogelsong at Capitol Records. Mm -hmm. So he had just gotten fired too. Yeah, right. Because Bowen fired everybody and brought in his own people. Yeah. And so he was sitting there going, you know, if it costs six thousand dollars, then what if we did a compilation CD, and we sold slots on the disc, and we sold each one for fourteen hundred dollars? The first five slots would cover all the cost. Everything over and above the first six slots would go to overhead and profit. That means this is a business. If all the record companies will participate, so he went around to each label and he said, "Look." I can save you money, service every country radio station in America, free up your switchboard from getting calls about record service if you'll sign on to do this. Every label said yes. Every one of them. Every last one of them. Jeez. And so it was amazing. From the beginning, it was the most successful, incredible thing. Radio stations were calling up saying, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Before you guys, we had to tape the new songs off the radio station 100 miles down the road in the major market. And sometimes we would miss the first few bars because the announcer was still talking. Oh, my God. That's how they were getting their current. So all of a sudden now, every other Monday, we ship a CD that's got all the new yep. songs on it for that two-week period. And it solved everybody's problems. And quality problem as well. Totally. And so it was gangbusters. And wow. throughout the 90s, it was gangbusters. And so then at that point in about 2000, we started getting some high-speed digital uh, access, internet access. Prior to that, we were all on AOL and dial-up. And, yeah. you know, you could download a song, one song, yeah. but you'd have to start it and go to bed and get up the next yeah, morning and much. one song would be yeah. there. Yep. So in order to get 20 songs every two weeks or 40 songs a month, you had to have high-speed internet access. Well, the major markets started getting high-speed internet access and then started getting a little more savvy on how to download music. And so Paul Lovelace, the founder at that time, knew that that's the direction it was going to head. So he started trying to acquire the uh, email addresses of every country radio station and country programmer in America. So he started putting a bounce-back card in the CD mailing. Hey, we need... This is... Paul yes. from CDX, we need your email address. We had radio stations literally in the year 2000 fax us their email address. They would write it down on a piece of paper on station letterhead. Hey, here's our email. Saw you needed our email. Here it is. And they would fax it in. Without not even emailing back. No. The, so was, the, yeah. the thought of them emailing in the year 2000, yeah. the thought of yeah. them going, oh, we should email. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, that wasn't We first. got our first computer that we owned in our house in 2000, and it was a Dell, $6,000 to buy a laptop. 6000 Yep, and it, and I think, if I remember rightly, it had only 8 gigs of, uh, an 8 gig hard drive, and I said to my wife, how will we ever fill that up? <laughs> now we have terabytes of space. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Oh, so there were fax and back email addresses. Yeah, so uh, we started building a digital download center because we knew we were going to have to start servicing music digitally. And so um, we did that. And over the course of several years, we acquired email addresses on all the radio stations. And, and the whole process started uh, really, really gaining traction because they were also getting high-speed internet access into the you know outside of the top 100 markets we're starting to get high speed internet access and so we started emailing them or e-blasting them the new music in addition to as a value add on top yeah, of the cd, you know, the CD. Mm. oddly enough we still manufacture a cd today yeah yeah and here we are in yeah. 2020 yeah. and there are 70 percent of the radio stations say we still want a cd we yeah. want a hard copy yeah as a backup yeah something that goes down in the control room a computer yeah. crashes we got to stay on the air we need cd backups yep yeah. 
So we send it to them, and and uh, and we continue to poll people and ask them if they still use it and need it, and they do. They say things like, "Hey, we can put the CD in and track through on our commutes to and from the radio station, and keep up with new music, or we can throw the CD in and let it play on repeat all day long and see what songs we're singing in the shower the next morning." Jeez, it's interesting to people. Yeah. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's a it's a way for them to keep up, because if it's just a digital download then yeah. that's about five steps that they've got to go yeah. through to click, open, go through, drag it, move it, put it in the right folder, yep. open the right player. Yep. It's a bunch of clicks. Yep. With a CD... Zip her in. Zip, you get accidental listens by being on that CD mm. that you wouldn't get if it were a digital-only delivery. Yeah, right. You know? So um, we feel like that we are the most complete way to service a song to radio stations that exists because we do it digitally and we do the hard copy CD. I think the a really valuable piece of information is just, you know, and this is probably digressing a little bit for you, but, okay, Miss New Brand New Country Artist comes along, she understands... A little bit about the industry but she's not fully she's trying to figure out okay I've made a record I've got an Instagram page I've got a Facebook page and they start building their own presence and then they find out oh there's a service that covers now what 250 stations still we service probably 1750 full-time country radio stations 300 more that make up country music makes up some portion of their broadcast week and then internationally in europe japan australia and places like that we add another three or four hundred so you're probably looking at about i don't know 2800 something like that's insane isn't it it's a lot and plus we service every employee of every major record company um, and so if you're Joe Muckenfutch, the artist, yeah, yeah. you know, you need to get your stuff out to all the decision makers. So yeah. we service syndicators, satellite operators, all, you know, all the programmers at Sirius XM. Uh, we service everyone that ought to get your new music. And so what we ad- do additionally is we are a source of information or we, we want to be and try to be a source of information for just what you're describing right there, if you're a new artist and you have Mike Flanders produce you a brilliant new piece of product, once you have that master in your hand, now it's where do I go from here? Where do I take this from here? And today is without a doubt the the day and age of the entrepreneurial music business. Oh, without a doubt. It's And it's going to become more and more and more so. The major record companies are always going to be there. And they're great at what they do. Of course. And so if you want to get airplay on iHeart and Cumulus and Entercom, and you want to be on those radio stations in the top 100 markets of America, then your plan better be a joint venture or a signing to yes. Universal, Warner Brothers, or Sony. Yep. That's the end of the story. Yep. Now, can you create a career that is sustainable where you can gross a million dollars a year and net a hundred thousand dollars a year and sustain yourself as an artist, a touring artist in the music business without becoming a star. Yes, Yes, you can. You can. And if you just want to make your living full time in music and you want to make six figures, then there is a plan for you to follow to do that. Yep. And it's not that difficult. Nope. You just just have to follow the steps and have enough money to fund it. Right. Yep. It does take a little money in the beginning to get things started. Yep. Nothing is free. But no business that you start from the beginning, even if you go back swinging that hammer, right. that guy needs a supplier, that guy needs the tools. These are tools, and I think people really forget, oh, I can do this on my laptop, and I can do this, and I can... Well, you can to a certain point, but you've got to invest in yourself. You have to. Making the record, you're investing in yourself. And unfortunately, a lot of people stop there and go, oh, well, I've got a distributor, I've got this, and that's just baby step one, you know, where's two, where's three, where's four, and how do you get 200 people that want to pay even $10 to come and see you in a room, you know, and this is where it all starts, and I think a lot of these podcasts I've been kind of, you know, touching the surfaces of all these areas, and the more diverse people we talk to, and having someone that's had really, you're nearly... I suppose in the 35 years then really, you know, playing this game, you know, 
And like me, I mean, my diaries date back to 1980 as a live player, you know. Um, and it's yeah. and what, you know, someone said to me last year, I said, Mike, um, forget everything we kind of learned the last 25 years and now we have to relearn the next five years going forward the new business. Right. And, and I think there's so many people here in this town that are so sharp with understanding their ability to earn. Uh, I'll never forget this saying, and this would have been six or seven years ago, I was down at the drummer Steve Brewster's house and my son Ben was on the session and he would have probably been 18 at the time, or he's 26 years old, so I'd say he was 20. Um, and he said, Ben, you have to understand what the new musician is. And I thought, well, someone like him that was that had seen Nashville, the cartage, you know, different guys setting his drums up in different areas. Getting is, triple scale. Yes, is now seeing that he's built a facility in his home and he understands that for him to survive and look at the pandemic that we're going through now, listeners, um, <laughs> he survived, I've survived, because we have learnt to operate in this smaller realm, having our own equipment in our home and being able to connect with people on a really good creative level. You know, I no I, question. I write songs with a guy texting, you know, and then finally we may get together or we may not. He might nut it out just by and he might send me a voice memo. Hey, here's the here's the kind of, you know, here's the melodic structure, blah, blah, blah. So who ever thought that we'd even be communicating that way, writing? But imagine know? the changes that Clive Davis has seen. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. He's adapted to change. Yes. In every single change. And so let's just look at the formats. We went from vinyl. Yep. Okay. And then we and went it's back. to. <laughs> yeah, now it's back. Um, but uh, and then we went to eight track tape and yep. we went to cons- cassette Cassettes. tape and yep. then we went to CD yes. and then we went to a digital file and then everybody's phones filled up with yep. <laughs> digital yep. files where they couldn't take a picture and they yep. go, wait, yep. I don't yeah, want yeah. the file anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want access. Yes. So now yeah. it's an access model. Yes. And if you look at the number of years between format changes yes of what we delivered music to the consumer usually on. 10 at a time isn't it it's about yeah, 10 at a time but i mean this technical uh digital age went so fast yeah it's unbelievable and so i think um we're here for a while yes i think access and it's coming back the the the, the numbers are changing in the publishing world they're monetizing Facebook. They're doing all these things now. That all those things are getting better, yes, and yes. they will continue to get better. So, so I think the business is on the up and up, and I think it's in a very positive turnaround. I think it's in a very healthy place. You know, even I think the pandemic made is actually probably, it sure hurt people, without a doubt, but it right. also gave people realization again. And they thought, well, here I am on my own. I'm stuck somewhere. I am creative or I am, you know, whether you're creative business or creative, you know, musically, you know, creatively, however that wants to flow and join those two, you know, hands together. uh, People have realised that they can work on their abilities a lot easier, even though we all started when that shift happened, we all were, you know, I was terrified for a Well, we took a dollars business and let it become a pennies business for a while. Yep. And so I left CDX in 99 and went to work for record companies. I also bought a nightclub during those years and owned a country honky tonk from 96 to 2006, which was brilliant. Um, and so I think the, uh, well, that's a, a good turning point. So then you came back, but then you also saw a technological change that no one else saw. We were talking about it. Right. The first time I ever sat down with you, I told you, you know, a concept in my mind and you were already building the concept and now you have a patent on the concept. I do. And so Paul Lovelace was the sole remaining founder of CDX. And so he called me and asked me, he wanted to retire and he wanted me to come back and run the company. And so the day he tossed me the keys and he was leaving as the elevator doors were closing, 
he kind of peeked his head through the elevator doors as they were coming together and said, hey, you're going to need to modernize it. And the elevator doors closed and went down. And I, I was standing there dumbfounded, like, <laughs> in what way? <laughs> what In what way? You know? And so I sat and I thought and I thought and I thought and I thought, what have we always told our customers? What we've always told our customers was we are a delivery system. We get your music out to the decision makers. We do not promote your single. We do not track your airplay. Um, those are functions of the label. You are your own label. So therefore that is on your side and yep. your responsibility. Yep. And so I said, turn that on its head. Turn that on its head and say it a different way. The polar opposite way. All right. We are a delivery system that delivers your music out to every decision maker that needs to get it. We can also promote your single. We can also track your airplay. And I repeated that to myself a bunch of times, sitting in my recliner. And, uh, and I said, well, a lot of our customers are promotion people. Do we really want to become a promotion company and compete with our customers? Independent promoters have always been, you know, a, a big customer base for us. So I said, no, we don't want to become a promotion company. But what about the third thing? What if I said, we definitely have the ability to track your airplay. Now, MediaBase and BDS have done a fantastic job of tracking airplay, again, in the top 100 cities in America. Mm. The reason why they only do the top 100 markets is because they physically have to put a computer in every town that they monitor. Yeah, right. Now, I monitor, like I said, what? Or I mean, sorry, I service 25, 2800, something like that. Pretty odd to do. Can't put a computer in every one of those towns. It's fiscally impossible. Yep. But I did the research on the radio side of the business and I said, all right, let's look at their sales growth. And so radio's sales of traditional broadcast commercials, 30 and 60 second commercials, they were down 3%. But if they bundled them with their digital properties, meaning their website, their Facebook, and to a car dealer or whatever, they said, hey, in addition to your radio spots, you also get these spots on our website, these spots on our Facebook page. Then their sales were up 9.7%. And so I was like, oh, mm. so that means their website's going to become more important to them. Yep. That also means they're going to need content yep. for that website. So I said, well, what is the easiest thing they have to do content wise is their broadcast signal. They're already creating a, a broadcast. So all they have to do is stream that on their website. And they were starting to at the time you would you would see a listen live, listen here, listen now button on their website. And I said, well, if they're all going to broadcast their signal on their website, I don't have to buy 2,500 computers and put nope. 25 computers, 2,500 computers in 2,500 towns. I just have to build one computer system that's big enough and capable enough to listen to 2,500 radio stations simultaneously 24-7, recognize every song played on every one of those stations, log all that airplay information into a database, and then build an interface for people to be able to subscribe to and log in and see their airplay. That way, they can geo-target their touring. They can geo-target their Facebook and Google ads. This is how they will build a career in the future, is by real actionable data that they can see. And so... I set about to do that, and we were successful in doing that. And so we applied for a provisional patent, um, and then we applied for a full patent. And seven years later, we now have our full patent on that technology, which is wonderful. And so a friend of mine put it to me really, really in a nice way the other day. He's just a sweet guy, and, and he said, uh, do you realize that only 9 million patents have been issued in 200 years. And wow. you've got one of them. And he said, now I want you to think about this again. Think about all the corporations that apply for patents all the time. How many individuals that sat in their recliner and wrote it on a napkin have gotten a patent? It's like a hit song. It's like, I mean, it's unbelievable. Mm. And so when you put it that way, Jeez, it, yeah. it really, really hits home. And wow. so we're very, very proud of the monitoring system because it enables artists to monetize their efforts. Totally. Well, they know if in, in Dallas, Texas and San Antonio, Texas, it's getting blown up, they certainly know then where to tour. 
You know, yes. they know they've got someone listening to them. So that's step one. Again, and then in know. addition to that, you can go into the system and your access is unfettered. Mm. So you can look at anybody's record. Yeah. So you can look at other artists that are similar to you, identify the radio stations that are playing them. Yep. And then look and see which ones of those most aggressive radio stations started playing that artist first. Yep. And then you narrow it down to your target stations so you know which stations are the most aggressive about new music from independents. And it gives you a roadmap to go yes. develop this. And then if you have the right personality, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, you to still be tenacious enough, right. tenacious enough to pick the phone up. You've you still know. got to live yeah. your life on the yes. balls of your feet, yes. not the heels. Yes, yes. But at yes. least we can draw you a map. Well, I think that the thing is, is what we're explaining is, if you are running, uh, you know, your own little cottage industry, I suppose you could even call it, right? Yeah. That. The tools are all available, and they're inexpensive tools. If you start a construction business, how much money would you need to start a construction a construction business? How much money would you need to start your cottage industry? Right. You know, if you want to sell physical things, you know, if you want to sell merchandise, you know, you have to going to spend money to promote. You know, get a good publicity person. You know, dive into the CDX world. You can do a lot of stuff for not a lot of money. And monitor yourself for six months and say, okay, well, I know I can spend $40,000 over that period of time. Correct. And if you then are blowing up in a state like Texas, Texas, you know, they're very passionate about, you know, music. And there's still a ton of venues to yes. play. And uh, you can, you know, Texas artists, as we know it, can play Texas and never leave Texas. So, sure. you know, and that's just an example. So if you obviously can build a brand and build it in a big state like that, you can all of a sudden make a living doing it. One of the other things that this lent itself to is charts. And so a chart is the tool or the barometer that we all in the record business have been taught to use as a measurement tool for success and failure. Yep. And so whenever you're collecting this kind of airplay data, it naturally lends itself to a chart. Hey, we got all the records out there. We're tracking them all over the country. Let's see if we ranked them one to however many, who's getting the most and who's getting the least airplay or detections or spins as we call it in the, yes. in the music business. And so we started doing a mainstream country chart right away. And it was interesting, the difference between Billboard's chart and All Access's chart or, or Country Air Check's chart in country music, um, and that's not the only format that we operate in anymore. It always has been, but now we're expanding into all formats. But at least in the beginning, we were still in our wheelhouse, which was country mm. music, where we started. Mm. Yep. And so we noticed that records stayed at number one longer. In other words, on the other charts, it appeared like it was a foregone conclusion and everybody in the major record company world over here already knew, hey, look, this week we're going number one, next week you're going number And they would be 52 number one records a year. Every week be a new number one record. And so, and we noticed like, wait a minute, Luke Combs has been number one on our chart for four weeks in a row. How come he was only number one one week and, and out on the other charts? Mm. Little differences like that. Mm. And so we put our panel of radio stations together to include major markets. You can't ignore major markets. Nope. So we have Boston, we have Syracuse, we have Savannah, and we have Spokane. But we also have Dothan, Alabama. And yeah. we also have these markets that are legitimate, great country markets, great touring markets. Cowboys in Dothan is one of the honky tonks that every country artist in the world has played. Mm. And they got a radio station right there and we monitor them. We're yeah. the only company that can monitor them. And so uh, that tends to lend itself to a more accurate snapshot of airplay of what's going on across the entire country because we got major markets, medium markets, and small markets all melding together in this reporting panel. I say reporting panel. It's not reported airplay. It's a monitored panel uh, of radio stations. So 
that not only can you individually look at a record and see the individual tracking, but you have this chart that tells you how you're doing. And yeah. so we took and looked at that chart and we said, wait a minute, there's legitimate independent artists out here who are touring, who are doing a great job. CJ Solar and James Robert Webb and people like this that are doing a great job, but they can't get out of the 60s on this big monitor chart because the first 59 positions are all occupied by the cast of characters that you would expect yes. to be occupying it. Yes. Luke Combs, Luke Bryan, and yep. all the other Lukes. Yep. <laughs> and, <laughs> I gotcha. And so um, we said, let's break it out and do a true indie chart, and let's identify indie records by the one determining factor is if you are on a record company that has its own regional promotion staff, then you don't qualify for this true indie chart. Right. Okay. If you're hiring independent promotion, you do qualify. And so all of a sudden we're seeing artists like CJ Solar and Dylan Jacobson and James Robert Webb having number one records on a nationally monitored chart, which we call the true indie chart. Yes. And uh, and we're publishing a, 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 a true indie countdown show on Facebook with Center Stage Magazine and... And we're bringing all this attention and all this light to independent artists who are out there doing the real thing. And we're giving them an opportunity to compete for a top 10, a top five, a number one, and not having to compete with Luke Combs. That's right. Whose record company yeah. is spending millions of dollars yeah. to achieve that airplay. Yes. And so it gives it a more fair and equitable playing field for these oh, artists and, to compete. And motivation for them to then work harder because yes. they see results. And I think that's the hardest thing is sometimes we keep chipping away at that massive brick wall and we go, we're not even making a hole in it, you know, but yep. then you see that you will spend more money. You will spend more energy because energy will come to your body in excitement. And I think that's the thing that we all got in this for. Yes. To be motivated and excited about music and great songs. And I think that, you know, having this available to people, you know, gives them so much more motivation. And I think that's the missing piece. I think we all, you know, when we started to realise what we could do with our laptops, you know, I mean, that and then all these other plugins, the mm -hmm. all accessibility for people, they know they have... And if their tool then can show them that result, it's a whole different game, isn't it? You know? It totally is. You know? and, and I laughed when you were saying that because one of the best lines I've ever heard, I didn't write this, but somebody, I don't even remember who said it, and I hate that I don't remember, but somebody said, well, what you've done with the invention of traction is shown us the right wall to bang our heads against. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We're still, it's still going to be work. It's still going to be a struggle. You're still going to bang your head against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. But at least what we've done is identified and shown you, showed you the right wall to bang your head against and yep. put your shoulder against and yep. to push to try and, yep. you know, achieve what you want to achieve in the yeah. music business. Yeah, it's beautiful. But that's, that's dead true. And I think, you know, we all laugh as you and I have both grown up inside these you know the bowels of this industry you know i i've worked with artists that the ink's not even dry on their contract and their ego is already killing their career you know <laughs> i think you know the beautiful thing is is yeah. having these things available to people that are prepared to work people that actually are talented you know have enough money to drive their little ship forward you know as i said i was talking to an artist that i worked with years back and finally just got his master recordings back from the major and and he was excited. He, you know, included me in his post yesterday. And he was so excited to see these old records that he's controlling coming out. And as I said before, we jumped on this interview. You know, he's happy if he can now get 100 people in a room paying 10 bucks, you know. Um, and that is a business. But those masters you know? have probably never been available digitally. Probably weren't. Yeah. yeah. And so now... Yeah. Uh, the yeah. opportunity is there to monetize them through that. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing. I, and I was excited to see even the original artwork and everything that we had worked <laughs> on back in the day, you know. But, uh, you know, they, they, they've, they've always been, you know, incredibly highs and lows in what we do. I think that the, the highs come when we achieve things we never thought we were going to achieve. And if we've got 
mile markers like you've started to set for, for individuals, at least they've got something now to go, this money I've spent is gone, it's good money I've spent. Because I can now see what it's done for me. And now if I kick my own ass and I then ring, you know, that whole area that I'm starting to get some notoriety in, maybe I can do three shows there over the next three months, you know, and that's where it starts. If you can't take the data from the traction monitoring system and turn it into, and turn it into money, it. Yep. then you're not built for this business. No, no, you're not motivated. Right. And you're, right. Or you're just not smart or you right. think that I can now, oh, now it's on there. I can sit back and wait till this magic happens or right. I'm going to go viral. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, how many people have said that to us in the, over the years? No, I'm just going to put that out there and it's going to go viral. Yeah, well, I'm not, I hope you're wearing your mask now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, because that's the only viral that's going around. Exactly. You know? You know, so I think and that, there's that always the, going to be an old town road. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's always going to happen. There's yeah. always going to be an exception to the rule. Mm. And so you, you will see something, some anomaly happen. Um, and old town road was absolutely that anomaly. Well, and I think the, the fortunate and unfortunate thing that we inside these same bowels, uh, the external things that have been created that create fantasy within artists minds. Right. You know, you know, the voice, American Idol. Sure. You know, the things that they've gone, okay, and you've seen the money machine then really kick into what's possible for some people. Um, that, you know, I've always loved the little guy. I've always loved the alternative guy that writes the song that just about, you know, splits my heart open. And, and that's what's kept me in. You right. know, through thick and thin, and uh, and enjoying the you know the steel guitars and the things that the the re the real reason I got involved, and and we joke about that because the real reason we got involved is because we love recording music, yes. And I and Commissioner Gordon in New York, you know, the famous producer up there, said to me, "Isn't it funny, Mike, how we do all this work and try and raise money and do things with these artists that we're working on?" just to get back in the studio. <laughs> so we're going to do all this external It's a work. vicious yeah, Just to circle. get back to the one it's little cycle. piece that we love, the creativity, you know. And, right. You know, it's it's so true. And, you know, I, I sit there some days and, I, and I'm listening back to someone's voice. Like uh, recently I've been working with uh, a guy that's just starting to finish a project, Michael McGregor. And, and I've been listening to his lyrics and thinking, you know, the beautiful thing for me being an Aussie is I could never interpret the Southern culture of those lyrics. You know, when they talk about things that they grew up with, where I didn't grow up with that. I might have seen the countries and the kangaroos you and the You didn't grow up roads. with sweet tea. No, no, no. And, and then see how he talks about the 50-yard line and all these things that, 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 that you know, that you know, I was playing soccer, you know. Yeah. But, but I love, in t I love um, throwing lyrics in with these southern guys and, then, and, and, and seeing their interpretation in country music. And that's, that's what's kept my heart kind of fueled for a long time. You know you what know? one of mine is? Watching an artist's reaction when they hear their song on the radio oh, for the totally. first time. Yeah, yeah, I've been there the myself. The first time yeah. that they hear it on the radio, it's, and it breaks them down. And 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 every time you hear it after that, you still don't get sick of it. No, you know. And but uh, watching you know. that guttural reaction to me is one of the biggest paydays, of course, of this business. Yeah, you're doing your job. Yeah. You're giving, you're giving back, you know, and, and, and it's a business that is, is giving back to these people that need a service. And yep. I think that's the beauty. I know, I, know, I don't know, um, you know, the Australians uh, had one called NFS, and I'm sure it was from your model. Oh, you know, sure. Yeah, it, it, not for sale. We've been for, copied in every country, uh, yeah, yeah. in every format. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, what do they say? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're very flattered. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's, it's, you know, when I was uh, putting out, working on records in Australia, that's that was the service that those people use. So when I came here, I went, oh, it's the equivalent, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's what it is. So we've spoken about your history. We've spoken, how do I get on the radio? You kind of really covered that subject matter. Um, you know, my reason to uh, talk to Joe today is, you know, obviously um, we met several years back, probably six years ago, 
Um, I've worked with artists. I've worked closely with Joe, used the service. The service is way beyond what he's spoken about too because he's plugged into into you know marketing opportunities record labels that have really unique services as well that i'm also using uh, with artists that i'm working with um, i've uploaded a bunch of things to this service and uh, it's working really well so he's kind of, of a more full encompassing satellite record label that's that provides every possible service that any indie artist or any major indie could have you know have to plug into basically you're a have to plug into right we so, want to be able to know. fill in where you're lacking yeah in any way shape and form mm -hmm. if it's everything from soup to nuts we can help you yeah. everything soup to nuts and even if you don't do it you know the person that, that the, does the, the do component it. that you don't cover can do it so. and does and and who we sit in a very unique position because we work with probably 20 to 40 new artists a month yeah right and so we get to see who everybody works with and who does a good job, who yep. doesn't do a good job, um, who goes through the motions, who provides only reported things, yes. you know, that's yep. not based in any reality, that doesn't help anyone. We we know who does what in every way, shape, and form. Mm -hmm. So we can help our customers navigate through a very, very... Uh, Turbulent waters. Tur murky, <laughs> yeah, waters. Crocodile infested waters. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say that, but no, yeah. No, well, no, I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, as we know, it can be too. You oh, know? totally. And, and I think the, the um, you know, I've been lucky over the years because I've, you know, met wonderful people and, and you know, I always feel that, you know, people can trust me and when I give them, you know, my little five cents worth and say these are the people that I like you know and it usually ends up a happy ending for them you know so at least they come back and say hey those yeah. people did me right yeah right yep totally and yes. I, I think you know I think the current status we're in has really exposed what works and what doesn't anyway yes you know because as you said when you look at real numbers real data you know it's not going to lie you know well I'll tell you this that we have been involved with Mitchell Tenpenny and Luke Combs and Florida Georgia Line and all these artists. We do this for the majors too, you know, yeah. and, and so we've been involved as a part of the team that has developed those and broken those artists. Yeah. And it's been that way since the beginning, since yeah. 1991. And so we've worked, we've put out 75 or 77 or 78 now, I think. George Strait singles to radio. Wow. Yeah. Well, well, I was going to ask you that because, you know, I don't want to keep talking too long, but we got, um, everyone's now has Netflix. We've all seen the new Garth, you know, thing that's just come on, uh, um, on, on Netflix. He's special, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Sure. Um, have you got a Garth story? Oh my gosh. I've got a bunch of Garth stories. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, May Axton was from Broken Bow, Oklahoma. Right. So uh, I got to know the music business in Oklahoma very, very well. And so pretty much was aware of Garth prior to all that. But Paul Lovelace, the founder of CDX, broke the first Garth Brooks single at radio, Much Too Young to Feel This Damn Old. And so then Bowen came in and took over, and the new regime took Garth's career to great heights but the original capital regime which was jim Fogelsong and george collier and and paul lovelace and uh bonnie rasmussen and uh i'm forgetting a bunch of them terry choate um lynn schultz who signed garth but uh tony errata is a great songwriter yeah i saw that in the in the in the in the documentary yeah and yeah. so tony was playing a gig at douglas corner <sighs> we mentioned earlier and he had just written the dance yeah right on and so he did it that night at douglas corner and he said this young kid from oklahoma came up and said tony i love that song if i ever get a record deal yeah. i want to record that song yeah, yeah and yeah. tony said i said you know what garth if you ever get a record deal i'd love for you to record that song and that's where they left it and he said about six months later garth called and said I got signed to Capitol Records and I'm cutting a new record 
and I want to record that song. And Tony said, <laughs> he was selling boots in a boot store and I was unloading trucks at CD at uh, UPS. So we pretty much had the music business right where we wanted. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so... Take it, baby. Yeah, that's one. And, and, uh, and so... So, yeah, did you, so he obviously, you know, you can, I, I never got to meet him. I've never met him. I mean, I've had a bunch of friends that have met him, obviously, and worked with him, but it's one guy I've never got to meet in this town. You'd love him. You know, and I You'd believe he him. doesn't live that far from here either, does no, he? No, it's pretty close. Yeah. So. And, um, you know, everybody's... And uh, Randy Bernard's in the next street. Oh, is he really? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Randy's there, yeah, yeah, which runs his pearl, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pearl Records. Yeah, we could throw a rock from the front of my place and hit Randy's house. He's just, Garth is is a master of music and marketing and um, being a, a superstar. He's yeah. a master at it. Yeah. And uh, one time during country radio seminar, and this is years ago, but they used to have, they have the New Faces show. They used to have the Super Faces show during country radio seminar. So there would one night would be the new faces show. And another night there would be a concert that was one artist instead of a string of them. Mm -hmm. And that one artist would be a superstar. And so it happened that year to be George Strait that did the super faces show. And I got to stand with Garth and watch that show with Garth of George Strait doing this show and, and watching him, I mean, we're as close as you and I, you know, and I mean, we're shoulder to shoulder. We talk through the whole thing and watching him have such reverence for George Strait. It was it was remarkable. It was genuine. Uh, there was nobody else but he and I. So there was no reason for him to put on a show. No. You know, He just legitimately was in great. Respectful, just reverence for George Strait. And I thought that was so cool. Yes. Uh, yeah. Of him. No ego. No ego. Yeah. Um, Appreciates every day where he's been, what he's done, where we he is. We went to the Songwriter Hall of Fame induction dinner this past fall, September, October. And, uh, and it was in the Nashville Convention Center. And so we had a really good table up close kind of, audience right stage left and they had these little side stages set up to each side and they would induct a songwriter and an artist or would come up and do one of their songs and it was dark over on our side of the room and my wife said that's garth i said what she said standing right there that's garth brooks <laughs> well Kix Brooks and Ronnie Dunn were sitting at the table right beside us. And they were looking over and, you know, kind of waving and chatting. And I looked, and his silhouette is so recognizable. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. You can look and go, you know what? That is Garth. Yeah. <laughs> that hat, yeah, 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 that's him. And so without any fanfare, nobody let him in. He walked in on his own, strapped his guitar on, the... uh the tech came over and handed him the mic and he walked up on stage and just did a song in, in tribute to uh, one of the writers who was being inducted. And then after that, just looked at the sound guy to see if it was safe to unplug his guitar. I said, can I unplug? And the sound guy said, yeah, you're clear. He pl unplugged his guitar, handed it to the tech, walked off the stage, just kind of meandered. This is a, one of the biggest stars in the world. Yeah. No ego, no protection, no, you know, Got there's no bodyguard. Nah. He just walks in. He's just Garth. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. Yeah, I, I think it's too. so cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. If we could only be the little finger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great way to end this. So if anyone wants to uh, get in touch with Joe Kelly, you can find him at cdxcd.com. There you go. There you go. Well, thanks for coming today. Thank you for the invite. I yeah, enjoyed it. I hope you guys can listen, learn, and uh, and navigate. So, Let's do uh, this again. Sounds great. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. For, see you soon. Thanks, Joe. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Thank mm-hmm. you.